Well, I'll go ahead and start over. My name is Carol Garrison. I'm one of the educators here at the John Bunker Sands Wetland Center, and welcome to another Facebook Live, um, live from the Field event. And we're going to be completing part two of the John, Punk, Bun John Bunker's Pond Trail. Before we get started, we'll go over a couple of things. Trail smarts. And as you can see, I've got on some boots. I've got on long pants. I've got myself some long sleeves to protect me from a lot of the... Uh, poisonous and otherwise irritating plants out here. I've already put on some pretty good insect repellent because the mosquitoes are pretty thick this morning. I've got a backpack that has a bottle of water. It has the first aid kit and I also, my cameraman has got GPS so we don't have a worry of getting lost. The last thing, it's always good to have yourself a stick so that you can check out different creatures and not worry about touching them, scooch a branch away and if you ever need to dissect a bit of scat to find out what's going on inside, is very handy. So we're going to go ahead and start. If you watch the first half, we're about a half a mile down from that from that ending point. Um, between there and here, it's a lovely trail, but there's not a lot of different points of interest. So I thought we'd scoot up to where we get to see some of the more interesting stops. Before I take off, though, I'm going to be quiet for just a few moments because I really want everybody to hear the bird song. It's really quite lovely this morning because it's only 10 a.m., so the frogs haven't quit singing, but the birds are already singing. So I'm going to be quiet and just let everybody kind of take in while Daniel pans around so you can listen. All right, now as we go on this trail, I'm gonna point out a few things that you might have seen on part one, but some of our audience members weren't on part one, and so I don't wanna skip anything. The first thing I've noticed, and it's just because we happen to have one of them buzzing around really sweet, we happen to have some native ground bees, and here's what their nest looks like. You can see, here's that one. Here's another one with the hole right there. And the one of the bees is buzzing right over here. I don't know if she's gonna land for us. Oh, she is, she's gonna land on that branch, I bet. There she goes. You can see her hovering over there and she's about to light on those leaves over there. So um, believe it or not, everybody always tends to look up in the sky for bees, but honestly, 70% of the bees that are native to Texas are actually ground dwellers. These particular ground bees are called gregarious um, dwellers. They each have their own independent nest, but they do have clusters of nests together and they are quite not aggressive. As a matter of fact, the males don't even have a stinger and the females won't sting unless you actually handle them with your hands. So if you leave them be, they're going to, um, to inhabit this area with us quite peacefully. Now, as we finish this walk, I'll just remind you that the Bunker's Pond Trail is a 1.8 mile loop. It really has um, some good qualities. You can see some of the bottomland hardwood forest that was part of this land before it was converted to grazing and then converted to a man-made wetland. We've got everything that we're ready to go, so let's go ahead and head out. Now, I, I, I feel like we always should point out a couple of plants right away, so I'm going to point out some poison ivy and then something that you might think is poison ivy that's not. That way, we know exactly what we're looking for. So when we're talking about poison ivy, and there's a pretty good bush of it up here that I'm going to point out, poison ivy can be a really small sprig. It can also look like a pretty big bush. It can also be as big as a tree. Notice we've got those three leaves. Normally the poem that you think about is the leaves of three, let them be. Not always, not always the case, but it's a pretty good idea to make sure that you, you avoid this type of plant. Now I'm gonna point to another one right here, okay? It's really easy to say, wait a minute, is that three leaves? But if you look closely, it's not three leaves. As a matter of fact, it's five. Look at the serrations. Also, you can see that the stem of this is quite, got lots of thorns and spines. That's actually dewberry. It's a native cousin to the blackberry. Smaller than the blackberry, and they have already ripened, and the birds have already picked them all off. So we're going to head down the trail. The trail's a bit muddy today because it rained quite heavily, so I'm not going to be taking these steeper downturns quite so fast like I did when we were practicing and it was dry. All right. We're going 
going to head over to our first point of interest over here. Oh, I've got another vine. So you know what? This is, this is the great advantage of live is to be able to stop and look. Take a look at this vine right here. Do you see that we have both thorns and also tendrils? That lets us know right away that this is definitely green briar. And if you can look closely, and I'm going to try to move the stick, there is a tiny infant praying mantis on the bottom of that branch. I'm pointing to it. Oh, he's going to go on. He's on the back side of the leaf. Oh, he just crawled out. Do you see him? Oh, he just fell to the ground. Now he's right there. Oh, well, there's a lot of tiny praying mantis. I'm going to guess that this is the right season for all those eggs to hatch because we've seen quite a few little tiny praying mantis that are mantids that are shorter than a half inch long. All right, well, let's go ahead and head up here to our, our first major stop. Man said he's seen several large fuzzy caterpillars, so I'm going to have my eyes peeled for those. On our way to this particular stop, I'm going to point out and ask everybody to, to, remind, to remind me, because we looked at this plant and pointed it out last time. Does anybody remember what this is called? I'll give everybody a chance. A hint, I mean, it has a common name and has a formal name. We actually, this is, this is an evening primrose. It's also commonly called the buttercup because look at all of that pollen. And when that pollen kind of spreads all over the flowers, it looks like a cup of butter. All right, we're going to head on down. Got some beautiful dragonflies darting around, so hopefully we'll have a chance to catch some of those on video. Several good plants, I think we'll try to ID on our way back from this point. All right, we're going to get our first exposure of the East Fork of the Trinity River. Beautiful and calm today, despite all that rain that we've had that we've had recently. So as we stop here, take a look at this old train bridge trestles that you see. As we discussed in the first half, if you recall, the Texas and New Orleans Railroad used these tracks. They built them in the early 1870s, and they operated until the 1920s when the tracks were repurposed for the Bodark and Southern Railway tram lines and hauled granite and other building materials back and forth. The tracks were removed in the 1940s, but these trestles here remain. I'm going to give Daniel a chance to focus on the furthest away trestle, and do you see that square copper-colored piece of metal? There are quite a few holes in that piece of metal sign. And for many years during the 70s and 80s, John Bunker Sands used that sign as target practice. So those holes were put there when he was practicing his, uh, his, his aiming skills um, here at this abandoned trussel area. We're going to head back. As we head back this way, I thought some of those some of those beautiful wildflowers we saw we could take a look at. Look at these beauties here. Absolutely gorgeous. I know there's quite a few, quite a few people on here that can identify these. So can anybody tell me what these are? Maybe I guess it's Mexican hat. Maybe you're thinking Coreopsis. Maybe you're thinking some sort of sunflower. We got some guesses yet? <laughs> I'll give everybody a chance. While we're talking about these particular flowers, I've just seen a nest for a particular creature that gets a lot of bad press. And so I'm going to point it out. Who sees this? We've got ourselves a wasp or a hornet right there. They often get blamed for just being a, a bad creature, being a species of no benefit. But you know, wasps and hornets are very important pollinators. Working on their nest. On. He or she is quite busy working on that nest and this is going to be too upset that we're going to point out anything. All right. All right. 
Walking with me virtually gives you a good advantage that you don't have to worry about chiggers because we're going to head out into some higher grass areas here to get a good look at the edge of the river. Kind of following, it looks like a trail that some animals have created for me. Walking through waist-high weeds. I guess weeds from, from our perspective, just native plants to, to their perspective. All right. All right. So let's take a look at these sandy banks. Do some of you see some holes that are across there? Belted kingfishers are the only kingfisher species that's native to North Texas. We do have a couple of other species of kingfishers in Texas. The ringed and the green kingfishers inhabit the Rio Grande Valley. Now, Kingfishers, their diet, small fish, crayfish, frogs, lizards, and aquatic bugs. Now, they forage by diving headfirst into the water, and they're really capturing um, insects and fish and creatures that are at the water surface. Now, they do cough up the bones and the scales and other things that they can't digest in the form of a pellet. Can anybody tell me what other creature commonly coughs up a pellet that we can actually dissect and learn what they're eating? Did anybody say owls? Because that's a really great example of another creature that coughs up those pellets. Now, let's talk about a particular, a particular quality of birds called sexual dimorphism. This is a big word, but I'll explain it. It means that in most species of birds, the males are much more brightly colored than the females, and the females are quite drab. You're probably wondering, well, that's not very good for the females. How come the males get all the color and the females don't? In most bird species, females are the ones that are watching the nest and guarding the nest, which means they truly need to be able to hide. Males, however, their big goal is to attract the female, so they tend to have the bright colors. Now, in the particular species of the belted kingfisher, they have the reverse sexual dimorphism. That means that the females are more colorful than the males. The name belted kingfisher comes from the rusty belt that they have on their body. When I was studying about the belted kingfishers for this particular presentation, I was inspired to draw a female kingfisher. I don't know how many of you do journaling, um, but I would like to share with you my picture that I did of a belted kingfisher. So it kind of shows that quality of the female. Let me get my drawing out. All right. So here is my, uh, here's my picture of a belted kingfisher. Since we already talked about that reverse um, sexual dimorphism, we know that this would be a female because she's got that fantastic rusty belt on her. The males look really similar. They just don't have that extra rusty belt. So I'll be adding this to my journal at home because I was really inspired by the kingfishers. Now, we're going to pan back over to the habitat across there. And let's talk a little bit about the, the actual nest that they build in the sandy banks along rivers like the East Fork of the Trinity River. Both sexes participate in the building of the nest. And I know when you look at those small holes in the sand, you're thinking, well, they don't look very big. They're actually between three and six feet deep. And they use their sharp beaks to pick out little bits of the sand, and then they spit it back out into the water near the nesting site. They actually have the tunnels angle upward. That way, it is harder for predators to get into the nest. And it also uh, makes it easier for it to not to fill up with water if the water should, ri should rise up. Well, the river is definitely beautiful and still today. I was hoping we'd see maybe a few turtles hopping off the sides, but we've got a few more views of the river, so we'll head on and see what else we can see along the trail. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I think my belted kingfisher was one of my better birds. I won't say that's greater skill. I just think that they have a great, uh, they have a great body shape to draw. All right. We're going to head back out. And I have a good question. I'm going to have my cameraman actually turn around. Because <laughs> I have this fantastic plant here, and it doesn't have any flowers on it. But this really reminds me of mimosa. So I'm wondering if this is the bush without any flowering of the, the mimosa flower or that sensitive plant, which is commonly mistaken for mimosa. I think actually, oh, we can see the flowers are right here. See, they're not those pink flowers of the sensitive plant. So I'm thinking that this is a variety of mimosa. Hoping maybe somebody out there can 
can give me the answer to that. All right, we're gonna head back out onto the trail. Oh, wow, we have, I've got another plant, and I, I feel bad. I'm sorry my cameraman got ahead of me, but I've seen something I've never seen here before. So normally when I go on the trail, I have iNaturalist up, but I gotta tell you, my camera's being used to videotape. So I'm thinking we've either got um, the, this is either the balloon, the balloon vine or is those, are those ground cherries. So I'm really hoping somebody can help me out because I have not seen these. These are brand new. Even last weekend, these weren't up here. See, see all the balloons? Now this is brand new. Excellent. All right. We're going to head back out. I promise this time we're actually going to get on the trail. All right. All right. As we head past, I can't help but show you this old piece of gate, and it happens to have one of my very favorite native Texas plants on it. This is hairy vetch. It actually has legumes on it, and I'm lucky enough to be able to show you, here are some of the little legumes, little pea pods, beautiful, beautiful purple flowers. Um, if, you're on, if you're in the North Texas chapter of Master Naturalist, you could use this as your purple observation, FYI. But what's so special about hairy vetch? It is often called a, a green mulch. Um, it's used as a cover crop often in between agricultural crops, and you don't have to pull it up after its growing season. It breaks down very quickly, and they just toss it right into the ground because these are nitrogen fixers. They pull nitrogen right out of the air. And Daniel, I've also got ourselves a female. There's a beautiful female eastern pond hawk. There she is. She just landed on that blade of grass. And she's going to hop around all over the place. Pretty good. We've also got ourselves a happy spider here building a beautiful nest. So we've got all sorts of, it's a busy morning here. Did you get a view of the eastern pond hawk or did she get away from you? Now she's over here on some giant ragweed. Now there's some beautiful cardinals that use it. All right, uh, so many things in this one area, we could just stay here for a, for a while, but we do have some other things to look at, so we're gonna head on. Also, thankfully, there's some shade ahead, because I, <laughs> I think that might be enjoyable. We've got a beautiful sulfur butterfly that's dancing in the air with me. You see these? Might be really easy to mistake this for wild carrots, but who sees every single one of these little burrs right there? If you've got, if you've got, if you've, and I can back it up a little bit. If you've got, if you've got a dog and you walk a dog past some of these wildflowers, every single one of those is going to turn into a burr. So you really have to watch it because hedgerow parsley, false carrot, and a lot of those happen to, happen to have that same burr formation. That's why a lot of times they pull out the Queen Anne's lace and the false carrot and the hedgerow parsley because they create those little burrs that stick to everything and you're picking burrs out of your pet's hair for weeks. We're gonna stop and talk about this one because we pointed this plant out two weeks ago during the last trail, but Curl Doc has a, uh, we had to stop for a second. I think my cameraman got some ants on his foot. So I'm gonna stop real quick and we're gonna talk about this Curl Doc. Just two weeks ago when we were looking at it, it was a pale pink to green color and just in the past two weeks it has changed colors and now it's going to stay this dark scarlet brown color for the rest of the summer. I think he got his ants dealt with. All right, I'm going to pass the camera back and we're going to head on. We're making our way up to the pond and I can hear quite a few birds. up at the pond area.
getting our first view of Bunker's Pond. Off to the right. Some of you may be wondering why isn't it as full as the wetlands? Remember the wetland is being actively filled with water that's being pulled out of the East Fork of the Trinity River. Bunker's Pond has to rely on its waterfall just through the rain. And actually there's more water in it now than there was two weeks ago when we were practicing this particular walk. pond from it. John Bunker Sands had this pond built during his management of the property and as a matter of fact he put up over 400 duck boxes on the property. Now wood ducks are an indicator species of a waterfowl habitat. Uh, they rely on cavities and trees for their nesting area and as trees are felled and not replaced they're running out of nesting sites. Now we're going to head over here because I have an example of a wood duck box and I have a real treat for you regarding John Bunker Sands so let's head over and look at it. This is a wood duck box to give you an idea of how big they are. They're mounted on posts. Let me give you a view so you can see. Already got some insects that are pretty fascinated. So I think it's always nice when you're talking about someone who installed 400 of these. We're not talking about a tiny bluebird house. John Bunker Sands had handled a lot of these and was putting them all over the property. I have a real treat. I was lucky enough to locate a photo of John Bunker Sands actually installing a wood duck box in this very pond. All right. Put my wood duck box back up here. We're going to head on down the trail. Now you can see in the how do the boxes fare against predators? That is an excellent question. Who asked that question? All right, excellent. <laughs> that a good question and like any other bird any other bird houses or boxes you build there's always the concern for predators which means when you put them out you do need to to have good stewardship in mind and check them i've actually seen pictures of all sorts of creatures taking over wood duck boxes um, everything from hornets swarms of bees and recently i saw someone who had a giant snake a really large water snake that had decided to take up refuge in the wood duck box so if you are going to install them you do need to take the attention to make sure that there aren't any um, residents that you're not wanting to have inside the wood duck box. Good question. Now you can see in the pond right now the water's quite low, but there is some standing water back there. Um, you can tell how long there hasn't been a lot of water because we have some tall sunflowers that are anywhere from two to three feet tall, which means that we haven't had any standing water in quite a while in certain areas. Well, let's head on. Oh, we've got a beautiful white egret that just went across the trail, but I'm sure we'll see some more of those today. Oh, got ourselves a pennant dragonfly that just, uh, we'll try to see if we can catch that one lighting on a... Uh, on a plant in the future. We've got several of these plant right here, which is a good example to show, which is wild mustard. Quite a few of them. If you go along, you'll actually see a few of them that are actually sending up. There's some other brassica varieties that have got their yellow flowers. So as we see those, we'll point those out too. right here. Anybody have any guesses? A variety of wild ragweed will get anywhere between six and eight feet tall by the time summer is over. Right. I absolutely 
love this plant. So we're going to talk about it for just a second. At first glance, it has these soft leaves like you think, oh wow, some sort of mimosa. It's very friendly. But let's look close, my friends. Look at those. Thorns on the thorns. This is honey locust. So be quite careful. This is a fantastic native plant, but boy, you got to watch it because those thorns are sharp enough to go through even heavy duty leather gloves. Personal experience about that, so do be careful when you're handling honey locust. All right. Let's talk about this one since it's right next door. Who loves pecan pie? This is what the pecan looks like. We, the early spring seed, the little, the little um, what I call the little wispies have already fallen off and we haven't seen any formation, but we've got ourselves a beautiful pecan. And these are kind of in a bushy setting right now. There's several of them in a row. I happen to see one, so I'm gonna point it out. Does anybody know what this crazy little formation is called? It's called a gall. It's a good one right there. They come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Can you get that one? Yeah. All right. Oh, I have a question about this giant hole right here. Let's take a look and see what's going on. Who sees this right here? This is a site where turtle eggs were laid, and this is the curled up leftovers of the turtle eggs. I always try to keep positive and think that the eggs actually hatched and the little turtles crawled out. Most likely because you're seeing this digging like this after the eggs were deposited, a raccoon came in and ate the turtle eggs. I've actually witnessed turtles laying eggs and have, and have a raccoon not more than 30 or 40 feet away waiting for the turtle to leave so that they could eat the eggs. The way turtles lay their eggs is the female comes up to the site, she actually urinates on the soil to get it wet and soft, clears her spot and lays her eggs and then use, uses her feet to cover the eggs back up. Unfortunately though, that smell of the turtle urine is a, symbol, is a signal to the raccoon. So uh, timing is critical to make sure there's not any raccoons around while you're laying your eggs. I see something very bright and colorful in a sea of green. Beautiful. Look at this. Oh my goodness. And covered in pollinators. I know you might think ants are a bad idea. And I'm going to hold it until one of the ants gets on my hand. All right. Absolutely gorgeous. I'm going to see if anybody can identify this one too. Look at that gorgeous color. Trumpet-shaped vine, huh? Trumpet-shaped flowers, coral-colored. Ah. Give everybody a chance. I hate just to tell everybody what it is because sometimes I'm thinking they might like to really guess on it. So we'll give them a chance to see. It. And I'm sure Linda will identify. Now, we do have something to look at here. <laughs> I found this last time. It's a turtle shell. The turtle's been completely eaten already. Uh, but I am going to flip it over. I don't think you can ignore things on the trail. They are what they are. You can see that this turtle did not go to waste. It's been completely eaten, and now just our final, uh, our final detritivores are eating the last remains of that turtle. Yes, <laughs> good job. I think I'm going to come back and get that turtle shell and preserve it. I think it'd be a really good uh, learning opportunity for students at the Wetland Center. Somebody will remember this from our last one. We've got a little wolf spider that's going to go popping across there. But does anybody remember what these are called? Buttercup. Those are the ranunculus. Very pretty. Very nice. Very waxy yellow color. All right. I don't know about anybody else, 
But I do, I find Johnson grass to be very, very pretty. I know it's not, uh, you certainly don't want it in your yard, but I think the colors, um, and as they as they continue to dry through the, the, the summer all the way into early fall, I think they're absolutely beautiful. talk about scat for a minute because this is a scat that we found and we really wanted to stop and talk about it so not seeing any bones but seeing some rough mm, lots of lots of grass matter any good guesses it's not pointed and pinched at the end so we're not talking about a bobcat not seeing any bits of bone so it doesn't look like coyote any good guesses I was thinking maybe we're looking at, at hog at first, but it doesn't quite look like feral hog either. So I'll, I'd like to see if there's some good opinions on that scat, because that's a new one for me. I took a picture of it earlier. working phyto remediating plants that we have in the wetland. Does everybody remember phyto remediation? I know that's a pretty big vocabulary word to start early on a Saturday morning, but that means that they naturally clean the water by taking out impurities from our perspective, but are actually nutrients for them. These very tall um, bluish green stalks that you see with the seed heads on top, that's giant bulrush, and that's one of the hardest working phyto remediators we have. If you come to the wetland and walk on the boardwalk, you'll see large fields of these in several of the cells. to our main view of the East Fork of the Trinity River. So I thought I'd give you some really fascinating history about the river. Amazingly enough, it's had several names dating all the way back to the 1600s. So I'm gonna stop my history lesson for just a second and talk about what is in front of us. Do you see that interesting depression in the ground? There's standing water. Are you wondering what's going on? That is a hog wallow. Um, feral hogs, all, all, all varieties of pigs, they do not have the ability to protect themselves from the sun and they don't sweat. So body heat is a big issue for them. So when they do find areas of water, they wallow into the mud and they coat their skin with mud, not unlike sunscreen, and they use that water to cool themselves off. Unfortunately, it creates depressions in the water where stagnant water can sit. And if we have stagnant water, then what do we have? Mosquitoes, exactly. So hog wallows are a major problem in, in Texas. And um, just because mosquitoes happen to bite me a lot, um, I'm always concerned when I see those hog wallows because that is a mosquito breeding pool right there. Thank you so much for pointing that out. All right, back to the history of the Trinity River. Like I said, it's had several names dating all the way back to the 1600s. French explorer Robert Cavalier de la Salle named this particular river the River des Canoes, or the River of Canoes, all the way back in 1687. In 1690, Spanish explorer Alonso de Leon named it La Santísima Trinidad, which means the most holy of Trinity. Domingo Iran de los Rios in 1691 called it the Encarnacion de Verbo. Domingo Renan in 1716 applied the name Trinity. And the reason why he named it the name Trinity is that local Indians told him that the Spaniards had been calling it the Trinity for years. So in actuality, Native American Indians named, named the river Trinity, shortening it from the La Santísima Trinidad all the way back in the 1600s. Since the 1700s, the Trinity River has been quite consistent in its naming.
Now, I already told you we were going to go see the East Fork of the Trinity River. That must tell you that there's more than one fork to this river, and it does. There's four forks. There's the West Fork, the East Fork, the Clear Fork, and the Elm Fork. The West Fork and the Elm Fork merge just as they enter into the Dallas city limits, and they form what we commonly call the Trinity River. The East Fork of the river, this particular branch right here, begins all the way up in McKinney. It flows through Lake Lavon and it flows through Lake Ray Hubbard, and it joins the Trinity River about a mile and a half southeast of here. The Trinity River Basin is the largest river basin whose water is completely contained in Texas. And the river is estimated to be between 710 and 715 miles long. So I'm going to give Daniel a good chance to show you the river. And also, we're going to point out some really great wildflowers while we're here, too. All right. Hopefully, the microphone will work. And we're seeing a great blue heron going up over the end of the river. All right. I love this particular part of the East Fork of the Trinity River. Number one, there's a, always a good breeze right here. And the second thing is, is the water sounds are amazing. Now, you're looking out at all of these rocks, got ourselves almost a little bit of a whitewater rapids going on here, and you're seeing a large drop on the left. Let's talk about that. These are called drop structures or grade controls. They are man-made and they are built to lower the elevation of the water but control the energy and the velocity of the water as it is going down in elevation. Also, take a look at how white the water is. See all that churning? What's making that water white? What do you think it is? Well, it's oxygen. Those are oxygen bubbles. So also, drop structures tend to churn up and increase the oxygenation of the water. The other major benefit they do is they really help with erosion. However, there's always a downside to, to something like this. This particular structure is quite dangerous for canoeing and kayaking. So as we look to the right, I want you to take a look at the river, and if you look at the river at the level it is now, then look to the right where you can see that sandy bank and those grasses. Just a year ago, when I came out here for the walk, the water was all the way to the edge of the grass. Oh, there you go. Got a vulture. This is going to give us a nice view. A pair of them. Fantastic. by a beautiful vulture. All right, I've also got some other flowers that I'm gonna point out, and I know it's hard to compete with all of the, all the birds and the water noise. Looks like there's a cattle egret down there in the water too. All right, I am gonna get in front of you, Daniel, for just a second to point out a flower for everybody. All right, let's take a look at this flower right here. Okay. You might think that that is a dandelion. Um, it's actually a false dandelion, specifically the Texas false dandelion. Um, quite a fantastic flower, by the way. It makes really good tea, um, and it dries quite easily. It makes really nice dried flowers if you're trying flower pressing for the first time. It doesn't take a lot of effort, and you get a really good, successful job. Also got some wild grapes going in here. Got a native bee over there, and dragonflies everywhere. So this is a pretty good habitat area. All right. Trinity River is very important to us. It is a, a way of transport and was a big part of um, the development in Texas. But I want Daniel to pan over because I, I, I see a wild animal. Does anybody else see that wild animal? Not too often you have the chance to meet a, wi a wild animal on a Facebook Live event. So let's go over and talk to this creature and learn a little bit about it. The river otter is native to to Texas, primarily lives near rivers and bayous. It's seen in mostly coastal and east Texas, but in the last two decades, there's been a great resurgence in the population of river otters. Now, you probably have figured out at this point that we're not walking up to an extremely friendly and tolerant live river otter. 
This particular river otter was um, accidentally killed in a trap meant for nutria. But the good news is, is that this river otter was taxidermy, and this river otter is now a critical part of our, our conservation literacy outreach team. So let's get close to this river otter and talk a little bit about the features. They are very elusive creatures, so it's very difficult for us to be able to, to show you a live one. Um, they are in the weasel family, which means they do the majority of their hunting at nighttime. So it is pretty rare to see them out during the daytime. Their populations have really been increasing in Texas because they were once heavily trapped for fur, but um, the fur trapping industry has, has reduced to, to virtually nothing now, so they're really getting a, a good increase. They are carnivores. They eat fish, amphibians, turtles, and crayfish. Now, this river otter is an important part, and let's talk about all the things that he can teach us, because this river otter gets to travel to different schools and teach the students that the conserving of water and the maintaining of our water health is important, not just to us, but all the creatures that live in riparian areas. Let's look at those webbed feet. super, super thick fur. The North American river otter has the thickest fur of any mammal. And you would think, oh, that thick fur is going to make them super hot in the summertime in Texas heat. Well, let's talk about that. The fur is so thick that it traps bits of air, and that air actually makes them more buoyant so that it makes them much easier to swim, dive, and float in the water. That air also keeps them from overheating in the summer heat. But this river otter is also native all the way up into North America, into Canada, and that thick fur also doubles as an insulator for them so that when they're diving into that cold water, they maintain their body temperature. The average river otter weighs between 11 and 30 pounds. Now, when you look at this river otter, you're thinking, wow, it's a light color. We're going to get this river otter can brown, but when it stays in the window at the wetlands, has lightened that color, so they are naturally a much darker color. So they are naturally a much darker brown. They're all about this color right here. That is down here on their legs. I'm going to scooch up by just so you can see that long tail. There we go. Their long, slender body makes it very easy for them to slide and play. They are known as one of the more playful um, wild animals. They do enjoy building slides and enjoying recreation. All right. Well, let's head on and take another view of Bunker's Pond and maybe answer the question you might be thinking, which is why did we name this pond after John Bunker Sands and why is the Wetland Center named after John Bunker Sands? John Bunker Sands decided to devote part of his family's ranch to building a wetland all the way back in 1992. He drew up plans and he was unfortunately not able to obtain permission to were not realized. Now, he had a long legacy of stewardship and we'll kind of get up to a good shady spot here. Take a look at the pond. I'll tell you a little bit more about the way he was able to, oh wow, some tiny blue. Yeah. Robin's eggs? Which is probably a robin's egg. Alright. I want to try to make sure we don't get ourselves in an ant pile when we stop for a second. I think right here will be a good spot. Alright, I've got some more photos of John Bunker, so let me get them out and let's talk about it. When John Bunker began managing this property, he knew that he wanted to be able to provide as good a care for the land as he could. He actually traveled to Africa and he learned about the holistic ranch management principles. These principles included frequently rotating the cattle around so that the soil impaction from the cattle's hooves did not, did not detriment the land. He did come back from Africa and he put those practices in place at his land. I actually have a photo of John Bunker Sands 
actually teaching other ranch managers this holistic ranch management style. To have the cattle on a frequent rotating basis greatly enhances the land because that impaction I talked about, it leads to more frequent flooding, it leads to erosion of the topsoil, and it makes the land itself not able to even really grow crops very well for the cattle to consume. By helping ranchers switch to that holistic ranch management principles, they're able to get better use of the land. So not only are you getting that intrinsic value of the land, but you're actually enhancing your economic value of the land. Now, like I said, he, after he already put in place the holistic ranch management, he focused on building the wetland and was not able to, and he did pass away of cancer in 2003 and was not able to see the wetland become a reality. However, in 2004, the North Texas Municipal Water District began construction of the wetland, and they used a great deal of John Bunker Sands' designs and implemented his ideas. Part of the agreement between the North Texas Municipal Water District and the Sands family was to set aside land and build the education center that you are all familiar with, and they named it after John Bunker Sands. Well, let's head further up onto the pond. I'm trying to see if we can get, we've got several of our a dragonflies, and I was hoping that one of them, ah, there's that one right there. Can you get that one so we can see it? It's here to the right. It's a female eastern pond hawk. I could try to point to her and see. Oh, she's going to take off again. Dragonflies are an adventure to try to get on camera, I'll tell you that. There she goes. Excellent. Wonderful. All right, let's head on. As you can see, it's a really large pond. The depth um, is, is less than four feet deep. But we just, even though we've had some rains lately, we haven't had enough rains for it to be um, completely underwater. But the very center of it has quite a bit of water, and that's where you see more of those cattails and that giant bulrush app. Get a little, a little further down the pond. Now you're seeing in this pond that we've got some willow trees. Willow trees are not are commonly seen around um, natural ponds like this. You won't see them in the wetland, and the reason why is that that is not a plant that's doing any phytoregulation. They take up an incredible amount of water, so you're not going to see them in the wetland because they're really not going to benefit that that idea of naturally cleaning the water. Those trees are just taking up a lot of the water. Take a look. I don't know if you remember our last particular walk. We talked about the fact that if you are into yellow flowers, there's so, so many of them. These little blooms right here, these are the blooms off of brassico. Those are those, those wild mustards and other, and other leafy greens that you see that are edible. That's what the flowering end looks like. Great for attracting pollinators. And if you grow brassica in your garden, you want to go ahead and let it flower and go to seed. That way you'll have the seeds to plant for your next year's crop. Okay, well, all I was going to do is, is kind of get to this last shady spot. Well, I hope everyone has enjoyed this particular second half of the Bunkers Pond Trail. Where we're at right here is only about mm, an eighth of a mile to the end of the trail up here on the rise, and then you'll be back at the wetland, and you could take this tour and then go on onto the wetland for a walk around the boardwalk or back to the center. As we expand our programming to include virtual experiences like this, I can't help but wonder how excited John Bunker Sands would be to know that his legacy of environmental stewardship is now going beyond his family's property and out into the internet. So I truly appreciate everybody joining me this morning on this rather warm and humid day. Most of the day my glasses have been fogged up, so I'm glad that Daniel was focused on the wetland instead of me. Um, if you have any other questions, I can certainly stay here for a couple of minutes and answer any other questions you might have. But I truly appreciate you joining us on our Facebook Live events. We will be having another one next Saturday at 10 o'clock. It's going to be hosted by our director, John DeFilippo, and it's a big announcement. So I would definitely put it on your calendars to join John for that event. Any other questions?